and a former Conservative chairman of Greater Manchester Council who lost his seat in last week's elections has accused the party leader, Arnold Fieldhouse. Mr Jack Berry claims Mr Fieldhouse was more concerned with his own image than the county's programme and it didn't discuss things fully with his colleagues. The Isle of Man is... Oh, back now to Stuart. Well, thank you very much, John. I thought you were never going to stop. Well, don't run away because we have a nice film coming up to say farewell to this old building, 33 Piccadilly. But first of all, I'm going to read the weather. Now, don't switch off, please. It's going to be cloudy this evening and tonight with showers, some quite heavy and thundery, dying out later. Temperatures round about 9 centigrade, 48 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow will start generally cloudy, but sunny intervals will develop. Scattered showers are also expected, and one or two of those could again be quite heavy, some with thunder, especially in the afternoon and the early evening. The highest temperatures will be round about normal for May, that's 16 centigrade, 61 Fahrenheit, but a little lower in the Isle of Man. The winds south to southeast, moderate to fresh, occasionally strong at first over exposed coasts and hills. Well, as well as saying goodbye to you, it's time for us to say goodbye to this old building, number 33 Piccadilly. The removal started already. We've packed into boxes our little mementos, files and papers. The desks and chairs are all labelled like Paddington Bear. Well, Monday's look northwest comes from New Broadcasting House in Oxford Road in Manchester. Since the 20s, the BBC has been trying to get its operation into the city under one roof. This weekend, that will all happen. The new studio for this and our other regional programmes is just about three times the size of the old cramped quarters. In the control room, down in the bowels, hundreds of switches and 40 miles of cable help to bring us up to date with the technology of the 80s. In fact, the BBC has been broadcasting from this building I'm in now since the late 20s. Manchester had been the second city in Britain to experiment with radio when Vickers set up a transmitting station in Trafford Park way back in 1922. The BBC's first home there was an old warehouse in Dickinson Road, Rush Home. Then, 52 years ago, we came here to old broadcasting house, rented now as then from ye old bank downstairs. Debbie Davis has filmed this tribute to some of the programmes that have echoed round these walls since then. 1929, the Radio Times christened the new home of broadcasting in the North, calling it the Temple of a Thousand Voices. This is the BBC Home Service from the North of England. Hello, children. We're beginning today with a programme for our very smallest listeners, which we've called Nursery Sing Song. Told where the cordman he did ride. Mm -hmm. Told where Those early programmes have a magic which has never faded, despite the crackles. The wireless was new and fascinating. The Northern Children's Our Team were friends to thousands of toddlers. And in the 30s, a new voice came to the piano. Lady Mouse, are you a man? I was doing songs at the piano, you see, and everybody that had heard me said, oh, you ought to be on the wireless, you know, you see. Anyhow, I took myself down to Manchester from here, you see, and I took fright, and I sat in Piccadilly Gardens for 10 minutes before I dared to go through the front door even, you see. And there was a wonderful uh, commissioner there, and he said, what's the matter, are you nervous? I said, yes, slightly. Oh, there's nothing to be nervous about. Here, come hold my hand, you see. And he took me hand in hand up to this number four studio uh, where I did most of my broadcasting for Children's Hour eventually. But uh, within a month, I got a broadcast uh, at about 7.30 at night, I think. Actually, I think it was a, a little interval between a, a concert that was being given by a famous colliery band. I must tell you, though, that my fee for that particular night was two guineas. Yes, I mean to say that the BBC never overpaid in those days. The producer of Northern Children's Hour in the 30s was Olive Shapley. We had, we had a competition every month. And once I said, draw us, draw the aunts and uncles. And one child drew us all sitting bolt upright in a large bed. 
And we all thought this was the way we sounded and <laughs> this was the way we felt, you know. It was a lovely, lovely atmosphere. The regular performers made an enormous impact on a growing audience, none more so than Romany. Reverend Bramwell Evans, whose radio rambles through the countryside, all done from the studio, are still remembered as great pieces of broadcasting. You know, the other evening I was sitting quietly on the Vado steps when I heard a snuffling noise underneath. I, I peeped under and there was a hedgehog eating a bit of cheese rind. Oh, <laughs> how funny. Oh, oh, oh that What's frog did startle me. <laughs> it nearly jumped on Rack's nose. Oh, yes, look at his expression. <laughs> he can't make it out. <laughs> Were you scared, old man? Oh, but I say, don't you think, isn't it marvellous, the distance? A frog can leap for its size, and you know, it can't see where it's going either. He was, uh, I think, a quarter gypsy. He was a Methodist minister. And the aunts were little girls, you know, who jumped around finding birds' nests and things. It was so, uh, so simple. And I always remember, if we, we found we had a gamekeeper suddenly in the script, we'd get Sergeant Bernard, who was the commissioner on the front door. You know, equity would go mad these days. But it was, it, uh, it did have an il illusion of, of being out, out of doors. <laughs> After Romany's death, his caravan was parked in Wilmslow and a bed was endowed at Liso Hospital on Merseyside where Doris Gamble and Muriel Levy presented Children's Hour. Muriel and I and Nan are standing by the very bed which is to be dedicated to Romany. Above the bed, the plate with Romany's name on it is covered up. And now Doris and I are going to remove this now. Now, these are the words on the plate from the BBC Children's Hour in memory of Romney. He loved birds and green places and the wind on the heath and saw the brightness of the skirts of God. We wish and hope, as Romney would, that every child who rests in this bed shall quickly be restored to health and happiness. Mm -hmm. The newsroom in those days was a very civilised affair, all collar and tie and copies of the Times. Today, it's not only changed in appearance, it's also moved position. This used to be the old canteen. We've built a few extensions and added a floor or two since then. No sooner had we moved into these buildings than, as ever, we were looking for alternative premises that we had grown too much. The official memos shed some interesting light on our relationship with whichever bank happened to be in business downstairs. There's a great deal of correspondence about how much we would pay to borrow the vacuum cleaner, about uh, whether we could put an illuminating sign on the roof. The bank thought it might be in better taste to have coloured enamel. And in the late 30s, when war seemed inevitable, the BBC was looking at ways to guarantee the programmes could continue even if the bombs began falling. And they agreed with the bank to rent a downstairs ladies cloakroom as an emergency control room for a cost of 25 pounds a year and the BBC mindful as ever not to be appear to be wasting public money wrote an official memo which reads for the information of posterity it should be noted that we are not renting these premises as a ladies cloakroom it's very tempting to add to that duly noted much love posterity <laughs> Been evacuated. A program of records made and presented by Olive Shapley. Hello, Mum and Dad. Don't get uh, worried about us. We're all very happy here, and uh, I don't think anybody wants to go home yet. Last week, uh, the boys and girls had a match of netball, and uh, there was 14 girls and uh, two, uh, three boys, but the girls won us. If all the children who have been evacuated were given the chance to talk to their parents over the air. I think this is the kind of message that most of them would want to send. We took our recording van last week to a small Lancashire mill town about 15 miles from Manchester and found almost without exception that the children there were happy, excited by their new life and pleased with the new friends they were making. The tradition of clergymen broadcasters was continued in style by Reverend Wilfred Garlick. This is the North of England Home Service. It's ten minutes to seven, and at ten to seven each Monday, the parson calls. Good evening. Whatever subject I talk about on a Monday night, 
I can be quite certain that somebody will write to me during the week and tell me why they don't go to church. You might think that in these days, when people tell us that only about one in 20 have any recognized allegiance to any religious body, that the rest would be content just to stay away and have done with it. But not so. In January 1946, a new program was born. It was called Have a Go, presented by Wilfred Pickles. And one of the earliest editions came from King George's Hall in Blackburn. Our volunteers from the audience were waiting to be conducted to the platform when in hustled Ben, a real Lancastrian, as forthright as he was upright. Say they, I want to be in this year quiz of thine, and I want to answer questions on tunes. I only know 11, so I've written them down, and I'm going to pick four out of that lot. At the microphone, he told me that he was 73, I asked him if he was married. Ah, he said three times. That's latest down there. Eric White at, and she's a good one. Then came the climax. I said, what's your favorite drink, Ben? His nose gave a little twitch and his eyes shone. Tea with centipods in. The biggest laugh ever heard in Have A Go, or indeed in any program, and it shook the hall. Back in the studios, they were making radio dramas, sound effects by Jack Hollinshead, with all the actors helping out. In, in such a thing as a storm, one would be winding the wind machine, another would have um, a cardboard lid with lead shot quite close to the mic, tilting it to and fro. And the thunder would be a steel sheet, which another person had to vibrate. Of course, if you were winding uh, a wind machine, you couldn't very well uh, follow the script and on many occasions where we had rowing and water effects um, we ended up with our scripts saturated with water and it was the only Ronio copies, the uh, duplicated copies, you know, they um, tended to disintegrate. Hello, Mrs. Riddle. Hello, BT. Oh, hello. Is your mother in, Ernie? Ah, she went to bed early. Hasn't she told you? About her winnings. Hey. Has she won something? She packed derby winner, hey. a bobby twill it. I've got nine and six for her. <laughs> Here she will be pleased. I'll go and call her. Mother! Mother! Mrs. Whittle wants you. What's up? Sarah, your winnings. Have I won? Of course you have. Here you are, nine and six. Count it and make sure. You mean... Steve won after all. Of course he did. Hey, I knew he wouldn't let me down. I, I must treat you, Jane. <laughs> You'll heck us like. I was on it myself. So long. So long. The 50s brought local television to the north, and familiar voices became familiar faces, like Tom Naseby, who read the nightly news of the north. And the first programme ever to go out from the studio... Well, it wasn't recorded, but it did leave its mark. Sooty should have gone out from Dickinson Road, where most television programmes came from, but a technical fault meant it was transferred to Broadcasting House, which was still mainly radio. protesting against this penalty award, but they're going to get nowhere. Kenneth Wollstoneholm began his broadcasting career here. So too did David Coleman. But then there's always been a lot of sport in the Northwest to report on. Television was now expanding fast. Colin Welland presented the first edition of North at Six, not in a dinner jacket. He was succeeded by Keith Macklin, who fronted the programme for four years. Then came Arthur Murphy, who handed over to one Stuart Hall. The programme showed the first ever picture of the moon. It was reconstituted at Jodrell Bank, who picked up signals sent back by a Russian lunic on the moon's surface. Since then, well, how do you pick from 20 years' nightly transmissions? Sadly, it's the tragedies that are remembered most quickly, if not most easily. Like the Summerland fire on the Isle of Man in 1973, in which 50 people died. This dramatic film was taken by a holiday maker. A Look North team were among the first people on the island to record the dreadful aftermath. Then there were the horrendous scenes on our own doorstep when Woolworths in Piccadilly Gardens caught fire, trapping dozens of shoppers, 10 of whom died and 47 were injured. That 
coverage won a television prize. So too did a documentary about a teenage soldier from Oldham killed in Ulster. Well, it was always in the back of my mind that sometime during his career, he was going to have to go over there. And even I'd said to him, son, I said, do you want us to buy you out? He said, ma'am, I have to take the good with the bad. But that night, when he went over, he left here to go to Ireland in the August, I was at the door with him, and he just, he never kissed me going away. He was a, a man, you know, he's, boys don't do these things as they get older. He put both his arms around me and says, don't worry, ma'am. He said, I'll be safe. The region's also produced award-winning drama. I've got to get down the salon. There's a lady coming in for a blowjob at ten past. <laughs> hey, that reminds me. I had a belting dream last night. It was 1954, in my dream, and I was in this Cadillac with a bird who looked just like Sharon Sheely. Who's Sharon Sheely? Who's <laughs> Sharon? The late, great Eddie Cochran's girlfriend. You know, she wrote Cherished Memories. Anyway, it wasn't her, but it looked like her. She had on a big, white, fluffy jumper, and the radio was on. Les Paul and Mary Ford, how high the moon. And I had a fifth of Jim Beam whiskey on the dashboard. I thought I'd get chopped ham with pork for your tea. Do you fancy a vanilla slice for your afters? And we went to a drive-in movie, and she kept on kissing me, and kissing me, and kissing me. And then what? Then I woke up. <laughs> You're tuned to a test transmission, and we must just... Radio Manchester began from here ten years ago and moved across to New Broadcasting House in 1975. Now it's our turn to follow. This is BBC Radio Manchester. We continue with music. A lot of unkind things are said about this building. Something like 5,000 editions of North at Six, Look North, Then Look Northwest have gone out from this gallery, but no more. Of course, this building wasn't the start of broadcasting in Manchester, and it's far from the end. But it is the finish of the Temple of a Thousand Voices. It was to be a quiz in which I would give away small sums of money for correct answers to three or four questions. We'll make our way up towards that floor. I want to share it with them. Good night. I was amazed. You would be, of course. I'm my horseman. I mean, I... On 206 medium on VHF 95.1 Manchester Industry Constables Radio Rediffusion. Five, two, four, three, two, one. Stand by to lights. Two. Mr. Ben and Northern Ireland. As Tony Ben says, British policy in Northern Ireland is a dead end. We ask if this could cost him his job in the shadow cabinet. 